And welcome along to Noise11.com. Somebody I've never talked to before, uh, Dave Flick from The Victims. <laughs> it came back to haunt me, that name. No, no I, I still I still go by that name. I signed Dave Flick now on The Victims, uh, you know, posters and singles. I used to do that as well, but, um, you know, for a while I thought I had to sign Dave Fortner because it's, you know, my real name. But, uh, you know, I'm back to being, well, I'm Dave Flick when I'm in The Victims and I'm Dave Fortner when I'm anywhere else. Uh, this is quite an exciting thing to do, to get something that you uh, were involved with when you must have been 19, 20 years old. 19, and 20, exactly. to revisit that, you know, all these decades later, we're talking about the band The Victims, which was pre-Hoodoo Gurus. This was the uh, the origins of Dave Faulkner. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the first band that kind of I made my mark in. I actually had played in bands in Perth already, uh, you know, kind of well-known uh, for a band I was in called the Beagle Boys before the Victims. But when I joined the Beagle Boys, they were like a blues R&B group that had been going for a few years before I joined. They were quite well liked on the sort of, you know, that kind of, you know, that bluesy circuit, which Perth had a very thriving blues scene. Um, and I liked blues, but um, uh, I'd actually fallen in love with punk already before I joined the band. And I, they even, asked, you know, when I joined, they said, what music do you like? And I said, punk rock. And they said, what's that? I mean, that's sort of new, but they thought it was a bit weird, you know, because it was just still very much something that wasn't really well known yet. Um, we're talking about 1976 now. Mm. So yeah, 77, I finally, um, you know, I taught myself guitar while I was in the Beagle Boys and finally um, got it together to form a punk band with James Baker when we met at the uh, first uh, punk rock show in Perth, which was the band called The Cheap Nasties that I'd also rehearsed with for a couple of, because uh, they were all people I knew. So yes. I rehearsed with them a couple of times when they first started, you know, getting together and uh, I was playing keyboards. But uh, anyway, I taught myself guitar because I thought it was much more important for a punk rock band <laughs> Be playing yeah. guitar, because James went on with you to Hoodoo Gurus. Uh, yes, you know, he did. One, um, one of the founders. He had guys. something in between. He had the sinus in between, um, which was uh, you know went on for a few couple of years. And uh, they we I'd I'd moved to Sydney. I'd travelled uh, overseas for the better part of a year in nineteen eighty. That's uh, seventy nine, should I say? I I worked and then I had another band in in uh, in seventy eight. I had a job at the end of the victims and. Um, and then kept working early 79 and uh, then I got into another band that made a lot of money quite quickly um, and I was able to pay for a trip overseas um, to travel when I was 21. So um, that's what I did. And then I came back to Perth and was in another band called The Victim, uh, sorry, The Mannequins. Uh, that had, that was the, basically what the Cheap Nasties became. They kept they, they turned into The Mannequins during the punk era and they kept going for a few more years. And I was mm. in them for a little while, for about a year. Um, but then finally, you know, they, I, I, my plan was always to move to Sydney or Melbourne and to, um, uh, you know, because that's where the music industry was. And in those days, you couldn't get <clears throat> anything going just living in Perth, unfortunately. <clears throat> it was, uh, there was no internet and uh, the record cup labels just didn't give a damn if you, you know, lived in an outside city. They just wanted to see you in Sydney and Melbourne and in their terrain, you know, with the, in front of their audiences where the business was. So that was always my ambition. And uh, the, the mannequins, unfortunately, um, were restricted from moving to Sydney or Melbourne because uh, the main songwriter, Neil, who's my friend, um, he was uh, actually at university and he's embarking on a career in the public service as he's, he's spent his whole life facing the public service and he's had an incredibly distinguished career there. Hmm. Um, but, um, you know, he, he he loved music, but unfortunately it was just, you know, he took a back seat to his other career and, and studies, so... I had eventually quit that and, um, you know, moved myself. So I, I came in 1980 and and a few months later formed the Hoodoo Gurus. And James joined a few months after that because the, the signers concurrently just broke up in Perth as it happened in early 81. And uh, James had felt like he wanted to move to Sydney or Melbourne too. So he decided to come and join the Hoodoo Gurus and the rest, as they say. Mm. Well, the third member of this band is uh, Ray Arn from the Hard Ons. Yes. Uh, not the original bass player for the band. That was Rudolf V, Dave Cardwell. David Cardwell, yes. You parted uh, yeah, many, many years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dave, David Cardwell, um, we hasn't played with us since 1980 when we did, I think we did one re, one or two reunion shows back in the day. Uh, I think I did one before I went to London in 79. I might have even done one in 1980 before I came to Sydney um, with, the, you know, so James uh, and David and I did those shows, but we haven't played with him since then. And he lives... Uh, in Queensland now, but um, uh, 
James and I have kept, you know, pretty much had a fairly prolific career, you know, playing in bands, as you know. Mm. So um, we felt like, you know, if, when we reform, we just want to get someone like Ray, who's a big fan of the victims. Um, and he's also had a prolific career in playing in bands. And David's been doing his own music, but um, not, I don't think he'd be playing live that much. So we just thought it was easier with Ray. So the first song, uh, Television Addict, was a song that you and James wrote together. Was that the very first song you ever wrote together? No, it wasn't, no. Because um, James, James was in a band called, uh, well, they were called different names, but at one point they were called The Geeks or The Hitler Youth. Um, originally Hitler Youth, I then became The Geeks. Anyway, they he wrote a bunch of songs, some of which ended up on Victims Records because um, James, he... Uh, he actually thought he'd written more of the songs than he had. He'd, he'd co-written them, but he, he sort of claimed he'd written them. And we weren't really aware of the niceties and the, you know, the the uh, correct things as far as publishing and all that sort of stuff. So we just said, they're victim songs now. And uh, we recorded them. And uh, then later on, we got in a bit of, bit of a uh, an argument with, well, not an argument, but, you know, it was like this sort of debate about, well, they're not your songs. They're, James wrote them in with a guy called uh, Ross Bunkle. Yeah. So, um there was those songs that start. We started rehearsing those songs first up, and then James and I were writing songs straight away. So I can't remember what the earliest songs we wrote together were. Uh, probably the, the band's theme song, to be honest, the Vic- "Victim," which is on the new, the current single. We just did a single um, earlier this year, which we were finally released. It was, it was recorded a few years ago when we did the EP called the Horace Mash EP, mm. and we had two songs we hadn't put on that. That and one of them was a song called "Victim," which was <laughs> it's like thirty four seconds. Yeah, uh, 40, 43 money. seconds actually. 43 seconds. Well, no, that's including some talking. Yeah. <laughs> and, the and, and the other 30, track, yeah, the other track on the single, uh, Girls Don't Go for Pugs, one minute 29. There we go. That was an epic. <laughs> <laughs> that's got a lot in it, that one. Um, yeah, Victim's very simple. And that used to be almost, you know, that was like our, our starting song where even like a, it wasn't quite a set, you know. A set close because we do you do multiple sets in the, in those days. We weren't like doing one show, you know, one set good good night. It was you know you were there for the whole evening or you know two or three sets. So, um, but victim was often our opening song of our show, and it is to this point. We have every time we play now, we always do it as the first song. There are Coca Cola uh, jingles that go longer than that song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you know, it's uh, punk rock is about you know short and sweet and get out quick, you know. Yeah. Well, short and sweet it was. I mean, there was the self-titled album uh, that was released, I think, in 2019 with 17 songs, and that 17 songs clocked in at 33 minutes. Right. Yeah, well, that's um, basically that's all our recorded output on, on side A, um, which at the, up to that point, which was, you know, I, I, I'm from the, from the old days. So there was the, the, the EP, which had five songs on it, and the single, two songs, and... Then there was an extra track recorded on the on on the, the television that session, which uh, was never released at the time, but it actually came out later on a on a compilation. Um, so that was yeah, eight eight songs basically for side A, and then side B was all these what we call the the, the bad demo. It was a live two track recording we did in in a house. We just set up a couple mics in a house and you know thought we could <laughs> make a record. Not well, make a demo is what it was. We just wanted to record ourselves to uh, you know to see what it sounded like. And it was not the greatest sound, you know. Um, um, but and so we never released that. That was before we made any officials, you know, singles and go into a proper recording studio. Um, but we picked the eyes out of that and just chose the songs that obviously hadn't been recorded elsewhere and put them on that as a kind of like a, you know to get the complete picture of what we were about, so you could hear all as many songs as we had, you know, decent versions of or or indecent in the case of those those uh, bad demos. We re-recorded some of those though for the the Horace Mash EP. And of course, now the girls that go for punk single. Hmm. So um, that was why we, and that was because we wanted to kind of scratch that itch about, you know, they weren't really well recorded and they were just, you know, literally a couple of mics stuck in front of us in a room. And, you know, yeah, it was pretty hot, you know, hit and miss. <laughs> um, sonically, very sonically hit and miss. But um, recording it again gave us a chance to kind of, you know, make them sound more like, like they should have sounded. 17 songs in 33 minutes. What's a set list going to look like? Is it going to be, is this show going to be shorter than a Seinfeld episode? I think it's about, I think our show is about an hour, hour, you know, we've, 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 we've done it a few times now and. Um, That'd be 30 songs. It, it's a lot. It, yeah. We, well, a couple of songs, Disco Junkies, for example, that's, that's always been, you know, from when we ever did it, it was always extended and uh, noisy. And there's another couple of songs that do that as well. 
So we don't, we do have these moments where it can kind of, you know, slightly get into a, not free jazz, but a little bit more, uh, you know, noise, noise epic, a bit like Sister Ray, the Velvet Underground. That's, that was kind of something we were inspired by. Disco Junkie, when I listen to that, sort of merges, uh, it's almost the Stooges and the Sex Pistols colliding. Yeah, it? It, yeah, and a little bit of maybe uh, uh, Roadrunner by Jonathan Richmond, The Modern Lovers. Um mm. You know, it's kind of like just a, yeah, one riff goodbye sort of song. And, uh, yeah, so that those were all things that were, as I say, Sister Ray, of course, as well. You know, there's a very big influence. And, of course, he influenced Jonathan Richmond, the, you know, Lou Reed. He's a big fan of Lou Reed's and the and the, model, and the other underground. Um, yeah, so they're the points where the, the set can be kind of as free form and as long as we want, but uh, we don't, we don't play those songs for 20 minutes, let's say. Yeah. So, so it's not going to be, you know, that different to a, to hear how you hear on the record. Yeah. What about a song like high school girls? That's got a very kinks influence. Was that one of the bands? Yeah, that's that, to that's a Ross Bunkle song with James. So he wrote that with, with uh, Ross. Um, that's one that, you know, it's hard for me to sing <laughs> as a, as an old man. Because it's it's written from the point of view of someone who's uh, basically probably not eighteen years old who's still remembering fondly the chicks that he thought were hot in high school and you know it's it's and he's actually saying I want to be a schoolboy I want it so I can make it with the high school girls because I guess he figures out it's creepy for an older person to be thinking about high school girls as well but but uh, yeah it's just a it's a it's a obviously it's just it's cute and, and silly uh, you know and and tongue in cheek but. Uh, yeah, it's, but it's got a it's got a great little you know bright riff and and um, you know um, and stupid lyrics. <laughs> so, so you know we wrote these songs just for the hell of it. They weren't you know James's lyrics uh, always have a sense of um, you know kind of the comic book and the you know like Ramones you know um, beat on the brat with a baseball bat. I don't think they were literally you know recommending that be, you know be what you do. But it's mm. fun to sing about, you know. So the same thing with, you know, high school girls or disco junkies or whatever. Some of the lyrics are a bit meant to be kind of in your face and kind of like, you know, arrogant or or, or snotty and and silly. But you know, they're uh, you know they are kind of colourful as well and and funny. James has had a great sense of humour in his lyrics. Well, maybe you need to change it to old people's home girls, make yeah. it a bit more <laughs> age appropriate. Maybe that'd be more of a protest now, wouldn't it? You know, like. <laughs> I don't know. We weren't protesting, but I mean, the victims were not a were not a political band. I mean, you pol- we were political in the sense that we were feeling um, aggrieved that we we're stuck in a in a place that we thought was very boring. You know, Perth back then was very. It felt, at certainly the age we were at, and like in the music we did, you know, we felt like we were marooned uh, in a sea of you know basically you know apathy, and and we wanted to kind of shake things up and you know have some fun and 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 singing lyrics that were a bit sort of outrageous was part of that, you know, and, and certainly musically, that was the main game was to kind of just enjoy this thing that we were so passionate about this music that was flowering around the world that we were buying records and, you know, and they're blowing our minds and we just wanted to be, you know, it was, it was speaking our language. You know, we, we were, we were ready for this revolution of, of music and, and it was the most exciting sounds we'd heard. And, and, you know, the Ramones was it still to this day is one of the most important bands to my you know, for me musically, um, it changed my life, and it still to this day nourishes me. That you know, loving the Ramones and what they stand for, those same things that they distilled about music are still just as important today. You, know, you raise a good point there about you know listening to the Ramones in Australia, nineteen seventy seven. It was pre FM. Uh, there was no national double J or triple J. Uh, how did people hear about the victims, and how did you discover new music back then? We were music fans. Um, obviously, I grew up loving music and, you know, um, and all the things, you know, you could go back to childhood influences and all that. We talked about the Beatles before we, we started recording this. But um, basically, 1975, as music fans, it was hard to hear stuff that wasn't mainstream pop radio, obviously, as we you mentioned. So what you do is you buy um, import, you go to import stores where there'd be records that weren't released in Australia yet, they considered to be too fringe or marginal. Um, to be of interest to Australians, so the Australian labels wouldn't wouldn't uh, bother pressing them up. So they you you have to get copies from imported from America or the or the UK. In most cases, is what the albums we were listening to. Um, and how you'd find out about those records would be through the magazines, such as New Music Express or um, Rock Scene in New York, 
you know, um, uh, sounds and, you know, the various mag music magazines where they talk about what's happening. And and as it happened, music, New Music Express, New Musical Express um, used to have a, a monthly New York report. And in 1975, we're starting to hear about this thing called CBGBs and, and uh, these bands there, Patti Smith Group. And, you know, Patti Smith did release her album in 75, but, um, you know, the Ramones and Blondie and people like that and Talking Heads, they were all being talked about and television. And um, we were dying to hear this music, especially the Ramones, because there's a description of this band that had buzzsaw guitars. We just thought, what's that mean, you know, buzzsaw guitar? Um, and lyrics about bidding on brats and, and things like that. It was just kind of like, it just sounded wild and, you know, we couldn't really imagine it. And and then it wasn't until uh, beginning of 76 we finally got to hear a record. But we, the first thing we heard was a, an album called Live at CBGB's. That was that came out before the Ramones album, hmm. and that was a double album. Oh, or did it? I'm, I'm pretty sure it did. Yes, I think it did. And then uh, that had a bunch of bands that we read about, but the, none of it was really punk rock. It had Mick Deville on it, Willie Deville's band. Um, but a lot of the other bands on there didn't really sound like what you know this buzzsaw guitar thing, and didn't didn't quite add up in our minds. But anyway, we played some of those songs that were a bit more like seemed a bit more uh, you know alternative or whatever you know. Bit, bit more unusual um, in the in the cheap Nazis. This was when I rehearsed with them. Uh, we did a couple of their songs, um, those songs. But then the Ramones album finally came out, and that was like at first it was so different to what I expected. I was kind of I wasn't really that sure about it the first time I heard it because it was so poppy. You know, the, there's these Beach mm. Boys melodies, and and I was expecting this kind of what I later turned out to be the Sex Pistols. You know, much more angry kind of you know. Um, stodgy music in a sense, you know, the, the Ramones were so bouncy and bright and, you know, yes, it had that chainsaw, you know, they, they had the uh, buzzsaw guitars, but also it was very fast and, 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 you know, like made you want to dance. It wasn't like fighting music or anything, not that I wanted to fight anyway, but it was, as I said, just trying to match up the description I read about to what I actually ended up hearing was quite different. And uh, it, of course, took me another listen or two, and then suddenly I completely clicked into it and understood it completely. And and it was like, of course, this is a, it's perfect the way it is. This is exactly what it should be. And uh, you know, and a lot of my favorite albums, that's always happened with you know the Stooges, everything really. First couple of listens, I was like, it was so different to what I'd been used to. That I couldn't quite kind of connect it into my taste, you know, yet. Mm -hmm. I had to kind of, I had to change to 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 understand it and and get into what it was doing rather than try to fit into my previous, you know, framework of music. Uh, so the Ramones was that different to, again, so they did that as well. Um, anyway, so we started, you know, obviously I was in love with the Ramones. I ended up joining this other band, the Beagle Boys, and um, uh, but I was like wanting to play guitar and I was writing songs and and then eventually uh, in mid-77, about May, I think it was, um, uh, met James Baker at the first Cheap Nasties show, uh, which was the very first punk rock show in Perth, uh, as far as anyone can tell. Um, there would be bands rehearsing, as James had been with the, the the Hitler Youth gigs guys, but no one had actually played the gigs yet. And uh, so this Cheap Nasties gig, everyone that had the slightest interest in punk rock from around the city all converged, which is probably about 20 people. Mm. <laughs> but... You know, we were very passionate people, and we could not. And everyone was surprised to see anyone else that knew about this thing, because you know, it was not something you'd ever hear about, unless you were just actually, you know, like a devotee and could dig dig through the record import stores and you know, order the records in, or, or um, you know, as I say, looking at these magazines and trying to you know figure out what it's all about. So anyway, we formed the Who to uh, sorry the, the victims that night, and. Uh, you know, probably started, you know, and James quit the, the gigs. He just, he, I don't know, he liked the cut of my jib or something. He thought I had some style or something. And um, so we pretty much just started from there and we, we got a, a rental, a, 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 a share house basically in a light industrial area in East Perth, which is now kind of a nice area of Perth, but at the time was very much, you know, a wasteland and, and you know, there's no one there after five o'clock at night <laughs> and uh, apart from, you know, drunks and, and uh, you know, you know, people near near do wells, <laughs> um, and we were some of the near do wells. And we had we had, we had our house, you know, surrounded by these like you know these, you know, sort of warehouse businesses and everything. It was just a house that had been turned in. Yeah, anyway, 
and that was our rehearsal space come you know meeting place you know and that, it was called victim manor victim manor uh, like that yeah yes <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, and we had our very first gig there some months later when we finally you know cobbled together a set you know learned rehearsed up enough and uh, that was the very first victims gig was actually in Victim Manor. So only two shows, Sydney and Melbourne. Yes, this tour. Yes, um, we did our final show in Perth, and this is like in back in June, and we actually thought it was going to be the last ever victims show then, because um, there's some stuff going on behind the scenes which I can't really talk about, but. Um, it's not likely we'll ever be able to play again. Um, and, and you know, also it gets to a point where, you know, should we even play again? You want to be playing while you're still capable of doing this music justice because it's very demanding, very high energy. And, and um, you know, and it's, it's, we're pretty proud of what we, we are, you know, as a, as a band, we're pretty, you know, we want to give a good account of ourselves and, and this music and uh, we don't want to uh, do it in by any half measures. So um, we're just going to finish it off while we're still feeling on top of the world and feeling, you know, strong enough and, and uh, you know, angry enough, whatever, you know, excited <laughs> enough uh, to, to, you know, to do it properly. And so one show in Sydney and one show in Melbourne, not in that order, Melbourne first on the Friday, the 1st of December and Saturday, the 2nd of December in Sydney. Yep. For two nights only, he is Dave Flick again. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and James, don't forget, you know, James and me together, um, and Ray, who's of course his own, he's got his a, a legacy in punk rock as long as anyone's. You know, he's incredible. Ray, a powerful musician, fabulous person, and uh, victims devotee. He made a T-shirt of the victims when he was in, when he was fourteen at high school, and that was a few years after the band had broken up. <laughs> um, he he just you know he he discovered us in a in a record store out Punch Bowl, I think where he lived, and. Um, you know, he he it blew his mind that this band that he'd never heard of from Australia that played punk rock back then. You know, for him it was the olden days. You know, as a as a high school kid, and he made his own victims t shirt straight away because he loved it. What he heard on the records. Yeah, well, he's perfect addition. Yeah, oh, he's great. He's great. Yeah. Yep. Well, Dave, good to see you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Paul. <laughs>